example. So that brings us to our obesogenic environment, right? So we've got the need to feed genetically determined. Um, and of course, there's been a lot of debate saying, well, how can we say it's genetics? Because if it's genetics, why in the last 30 years have everything changed? Um, and this is a lovely graph from America. You can see 1990 in the top there, 2000, the more orange it is. Um, the more the higher percentage of the population has the BMI over 30. Um, and we can see there's been a dramatic increase in, in, in people's weights since just in the last 20, 30 years. This is the numbers in South Africa. This is from 1980 is the, the pink and the green um, is 2015. And you can see this increase that we are seeing in obesity in both adults and children. And this is an interesting graph that is specifically from... Um, the uh it's, it's uh, they've actually now looked into the future so they're looking towards 2013 if you if we follow the current trends and i just want to emphasize this just this one little line here that it's projected that women in south africa by at the current trends by the time we hit 2030 almost 50 percent will have a bmi over 30 and you can see here from 2010 also we've got the steady increase of overall weight um, and just interesting to note the difference there between women and men. So also it's interesting because this is probably largely subcutaneous fat, right? Mm -hmm. um, we'll get back to that as well. So it's interesting when we look at this change, because now one goes, well, hold on, you know, you say genetics, but surely it's, it's not just genetics because things have shifted. But when we look at the graphs, we can see that it's not that everybody who's now been put in this new eating environment, uh, then we all, our weight should have all shifted to one in one in, this is what the graph should have looked like, the top graph. But what we actually see when you look at the actual data is that some people are much more affected than other people. Now it's going to get interesting. So they've done twin studies, identical twin studies, to try and figure out how much of your adult weight is genetically determined. And there's quite a large confidence interval there, saying between 40 to 70% of our adult weight has been genetically determined. Now just remember that your adult height, 80% of your adult height is uh, genetically determined. So 70% is, is quite high. But then they started looking at which people get affected more. And this is where it gets interesting. So there's a 70% and concordance in families that's at a lower socioeconomic status. So basically what it means is that on the lower end of the spectrum, people in higher resource settings are more able to override that need to feed. So if you've got more resources, you've got more power over your environment than if you've got less resources. So the, the big change, of course, in the 30 years when we talk about the obesogenic environment is ultra-processed food. Um, and it's quite good to be able to clearly define what we mean by that. This is the NOVA classification. And of course, we've been processing food for hundreds and thousands of years to make them um, last longer and make them easier to travel with and easier to eat. Um, and it's just to start understanding what these different processes are. So I'll go through them very briefly. So group one year is our typical unprocessed or minimal processed fluid, like fresh, dry, or frozen vegetables, your fruit, your grains. These are the things that's only got one ingredient on the packet or might not even be in a packet. Group two is when we make culinary ingredients by processing. So we remove the the olive oil from the olives, or we make cream or butter out of the out of the milk, um, or we take maple syrup out of the trees, or we take sugar out of the sugar cane. So these are your all ingredients that's been, and usually typically also one ingredient that's, but it's come from some basic processing, such as pressing or refining or grinding um, things up. Group three is the typical processed foods we can also make in our own homes. So when we can or pickle vegetables um, or fruit, when we bake bread, um, when we make cheese, usually our kind of cheese you can, you can make in your home setting, when we salt our own beef, make our own biltong at home um, and things like wine, beer and cider. And quite often these do have something added from group two. So you've added some salt or some sugar or some oil to help you with the preservation of that food. As soon as we talk about ultra processed food, we're actually talking about formulations that has to go through some sort of factory setting. Um, and this is our typical sugar sweetened beverages, our packed snacks, our reconstituted meat products, et cetera. So if you want to look at how do you identify an ultra processed food, we're gonna use the definition from NOVA, which basically says it's an industrial formulation that's usually got five or more ingredients. So when you look in your packet, there's gonna be more than five on them. And this is the, 
important bit, it contains substances not normally used in home or restaurant cooking. So you can't go to your cupboard and or to the shop and go and buy some of the ingredients that you find on the packet. So for example, one of my favorite things, we've got an air fryer, very exciting, a sweet potato fries, for example. So when you look at your potato fries and you might think, oh, maybe, you know, cut up some sweet potatoes, bit of oil, pop them in the fryer. And then if we look at our ingredient list, yeah, well, there's definitely more than five ingredients in my sweet potato fries. And then if you look, oh, no, I might not have any modified maize starch on my in my cupboard. Uh, I don't have tapioca dextrin. I do not have E160C or E415 or E551. Important to note is that this is just telling us how things get produced. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's toxic. It's certainly not toxic in the short term. I'm not going to keel over when I have my sweet potato crisps. And not all UPFs um, are necessarily unhealthy. So we also use some of these very fancy processes to make your fancy vegan products, to make all your almond milks and oat milks and all of those replacement milks. So there's a lot of products in the, the fancy health food section that will also be classified as ultra processed food. So which UPFs are the ones that I'm going to be um, demonizing tonight? And I'm going to call them cheap UPFs. And these are the ultra processed foods that we as a human race has invented for very good reason to help us feed the masses, to help us feed the 8 billion people that we have on this planet. And we basically created foods that are we can mass produce easily. We can distribute across massive areas easily. I mean, you can have Coca-Cola in the USA providing Coca-Cola literally to the whole world. Um, we can create food that is easy to prepare and needs minimal um, processes um, at home to actually cook those foods. And create foods that are long lasting and easy to store in your cupboards um, and of course make them tasty um, and lovely to eat. So if you want to create an ultra processed food, there's certain things you need to be able to do. So firstly, you've got to remove any components that might be bacteria prone. So for example, your fiber, um, all the, you know, this is the bits that the ants and the bacteria particularly like. So you take out any fiber, both soluble and unsoluble. You need to find some cheap base components. So mass maize, mass wheat is quite popular. Things like your cheaper oils, like your palm oils, things that you can mass produce. If you're going to have protein in it, you want to create cheap protein. So I'm sure my, some of you might have heard about pink slime. Oh, there's a picture. Ha. So what they do is they take all the leftover bits of meat, whether it's white or, or red. You get white slime and pink slime. Um, basically, it gets put through massive um, filters and sieves and machines, to, and then it gets uh, put through a huge chemical process to completely sterilize and clean it. And you basically end up with this paste. So, of course, nobody's going to eat that. So then you add some emulsified thickness and con for consistency, and you can turn it into that. So all of our chicken nuggets and all those lovely processed chicken burgers and, and things that we eat are usually all produced from pink or white slime. Um, then we need to add some preservatives to some of our meat products. Nitrate's very popular. So all of our processed meats, like our cold meats, et cetera. And unfortunately, there's now very good evidence of nitrates and its role, especially within um, uh, cancers in, in humans. So there's more and more warnings around the amount of processed meat that we eat. And then, of course, you want to add some sugar or salt or fat to make your ultra processed food more edible. So what you end up with is a final product that's high in fat, high in carbs and refined carbs, mostly like sugars or basically something that will turn into sugar as soon as you put it in your, in your stomach and high amounts of salt. And what you've removed is it's low in protein. So even when you use the pink slime, you've added enough of all these other things. So the actual amount of protein is, is relatively low. It's got usually very little, almost no fiber and very little vitamins and minerals are left over after this process, unless they add all those extra ones, you know, like you do in your Kellogg's cornflakes kind of a thing. So what's been happening is because I think of the, the massive rise in world population, our need to have cheap access to food, ultra processed food has really started to take off in the last 20 years. And this is some of our top world people and the top users in the world. So the Netherlands uses uh, 143 kilograms of UPF per person per year. The Americans are on the top of the, the chart for um, ultra processed drinks. So those are your Cokes and your Twizzers at 238 kilograms per person per year of whatever their favorite soft drinks are. Um, and in Europe, Australia, and North America, they now find that more than 50% of the calories that people eat are coming from ultra processed foods. And more worrying is that that percentage is much higher in children. 
So this is some South Africa data. Um, and you can see at the top here is the amount of sales per kilograms per, per head as well. And we're not quite as bad as the Netherlands, but um, what's important is to watch out increases. So you can see in 2006, we were eating about 31 kilograms of ultra processed food per day. And that is increased now to 42 kilograms in 2024. Um, and you can see the our um, ultra processed drinks has gone up from 76 uh, liters per person um, per year up to 132. That's almost doubled now the amount of soft drinks that that we are drinking as as a country. Um, and so overall, we can see across the world they are now plotting uh, and showing this this massive increase of the use of ultra processed food. So of course, if we put it all together, it becomes quite obvious. We've got this food that's high in high in fat, high in salt, high in um, calories. Um, and they've shown that every 1% increase in availability of ultra processed food in a household, so more you have in your strawwood cupboards, the more there will be an obesity prevalence um, within your area. So what happens with all this ultra processed food is that there's very good research now that if you are offered um, both options, so they did this lovely study go and look it up, where they put people two weeks in a scenario where they gave them three meals a day of unprocessed diet or they could have the next two weeks they had three meals a day of ultra processed diet so they had these groups two weeks two weeks and then they swapped them um, around and what they found is that during the two weeks where the people were offered the ultra processed meals which were all matched and everything is that you would tend to eat on average 500 calories a day more so remember the average human being eats between 2000 and 2500 so that's almost a 25 percent increase in your energy take just because of the food that's on offer the other big issue with your ultra processed food is because it's mostly carbohydrates and very refined carbohydrates, it's easily absorbed in the top part of the gut and actually very little of it reaches our ileum and colon. So from the appetite center point of view, you haven't eaten. So it does not get any messaging back um, from a need to feed point of view that actually you are now full and um, you don't need to eat anything more. Apart from the fact that part of our appetite center, especially in different people's genetics, will actually have a craving for that fat carbs combination um, in terms of, of, of feeding up. And then, of course, there is a whole uh, science around the design of taste of these food. We get a huge dopamine award with a lot of these UPFs that we are Eve eating. And some people are more vulnerable to, for example, sugar cravings or comfort eating. Um, and all of this means that if you already have, if you're already somebody that's on average hungrier because of your genetic makeup and you are exposed to a lot of UPFs, um, it's almost inevitable that you will gain weight. So when we start looking at socioeconomic status, um, when we think in terms of poverty, poverty, I'm talking about having a lack of money, a lack of time as well, and a lack of knowledge. And all of this contributes to our ability to actually go and buy fancy ingredients and make a home cooked meal. Um, and this is actually stats from America, from UNICEF, where they now talk about just moderate food insecurity already massively compromises on the quality and variety of food. So UNICEF, and this is actually data from Europe, interestingly enough, is already in, concerned about what they call hidden hunger, which is the deficiencies in vitamins and essential nutrients, um, including protein and fiber that they're seeing more and more in children. And then very worrying that two thirds, and this is a UNICEF stat, of children in the world are not being fed the recommended diverse diet for healthy development. And part of that is that such a huge percentage of their food is made up of ultra processed food. So um, what is, um, there's a lot of data, I'm actually not gonna go through this in detail, which shows that the wealthy eat much less fast food. And in England, they've actually plotted and shown that your fast food outlets are much more concentrated in your lower socioeconomic areas where there's much more a need for having food that is cheaper and easy to prepare and not time consuming to cook. And in South Africa, we've actually seen that there's an increased probability of being overweight just if you are within the vicinity of a supermarket or a fast food restaurant. So this particular study, which was, I think, three years ago, did find that living in traditional areas and farming areas actually has a negative effect in terms of weight gain. So people seem to be still healthier. But we do find that 
the rural areas are slowly changing. So a couple of years ago, when we had the Bella Bella Rudasa conference, there was actually a presentation from a dietitian that we were looking at, you know, the traditional diets that we used to eat in the rural areas had a high level of fiber and plant protein. So your typical samp and beans is an amazing um, meal, for example. Quite often when you have stews, you would have all these whole vegetables um, and, and meat um, that used to be the sort of mainstay of the rural diet. But we're already seeing that the rural areas are shifting. And even in some of your most rural areas, um, when you drive out, for example, into the OR Tambo district, you will see fast more out into your peripheral areas. Um, and more and more street vendors also will actually at the supermarkets will be supplying a whole range of ultra processed food, which is much easier to keep, much easier to store and much easier to supply um, rather than your traditional fruits and vegetables and meat, etc. And so there's a concern that we're already seeing in rural areas, this, this, this shift um, towards a bigger introduction of ultra processed food into the diet. So I've got a last few slides in terms of how that practically affects us when we're actually speaking to, to patients. And I think one of the big re risks is, and these are some of, the, uh, some of the inspiration I want to bring out there sort of for research questions, is, um, is my particular patient at risk because of their weight? So we have a very bad habit because of the BMI that we will go, oh, you're overweight, you have to lose weight. But actually, a lot of our patients might be an absolutely fine for the weight that they are. And then there might be other patients who's not very overweight, but is already starting to show the effects of lipotoxicity. So we don't know how to tell from a particular person that we're meeting now what their health is going to be like in the future. Um, and we do know already that different people have got different levels of weight in the country depending on their race and their sex, and yet we can't interpret that. What we can identify though, is if the risk is currently increased. So it is useful to look for metabolic syndrome. I'm looking at the diagnostic criteria from the, the 2018 dyslipidemia guideline. Um, and the important thing is to throw out the BMI um, and we're gonna focus on doing a waist circumference, looking at some key things on the lipogram and looking at a blood pressure and glucose. Um, and there we can see when we start seeing the waist circumference increasing in combination with changes in your triglycerides, changes in your HDL cholesterol, and increasing sort of creeping up of blood pressure and glucose, um, you need to have at least three of those. You're going to start being concerned that for this particular person, that that weight is a problem. So just a reminder that any patient that already has comorbid disease, we do want to give some sort of advice in terms of lifestyle modifications. So if they've already got diabetes or hypertension, et cetera. And then if patients have metabolic syndrome, you can use your framing and risk assessment to try and get an idea. What is their 10-year cardiovascular risk? And therefore, do I want to, do I need to start talking about lifestyle or can we actually relax? The big question is, though, is that we get quite often we will then watch the weight quite closely, but does it actually matter? And this we don't know. So we've seen from studies that most of the benefit that people achieve in terms of cardiovascular risk and their blood pressure is getting better and their sugar is getting better and all of that is achieved already within the first five or 10 percent of weight loss. And that doesn't matter where you start. So if you drop from 90 to 82 or from 100 to 92, it makes no difference. You are already um, showing massive improvement in your in your in your risk factors and so there's a question that well is it because you've lost weight or is it because you've so dramatically changed your diet and changed what you eat and that it's affecting your weight um, and this can become important that maybe we shouldn't be watching the scales but maybe we should be watching and focusing on for example some of these um, things like the blood pressure um, and if the blood pressure is getting better and the weight's not coming off to not focus so much on the scales. Now, when this got really, really interesting was uh, some discoveries they made when they were doing gastric bypass surgery. So you can see uh, what they've done in gastric bypass surgery. This is for morbidly obese people. They actually bypass most of the stomach as well as the duodenum and they link it in directly to the yeyenum. Now, what was interesting with this is they were doing this for people with type 2 diabetes who are morbidly obese, and they noticed that within 24 hours, there was a massive improvement in blood sugar control, and the eating behavior changed. People literally felt like having a salad. 
How odd was that? And this was before any weight was lost. So people were better, even though we, they still haven't actually shifted, shifted any, any weight. And this is, of course, when they discovered GLP-1, which is this wonderful hormone I keep on mentioning. GLP-1 is not the only one. It's just the one that's hit the, no, hit the news and that's been medicated. But there's a whole host of gut hormones. And what actually happens is because a lot of undigested food is hitting this lower part of the gut, the ileum, it now actually creates this um, magical... Uh, experience oh, magical experience that's the right word suddenly having this experience of being satiated of not needing to eat of changing what you crave um, and already also affecting your your sugar control so what they discovered with the glp1 is that it also then increases insulin release um, and then also has this effect of reducing the appetite so um, I've, i'm giving to oh i'm going to run five minutes late apologies for that so um, I've got two little approaches. The one is when you have your resource-rich patients, and that can be also in your rural area. Um, sometimes that might be staff that you're actually working with or somebody who is a little bit more educated um, and is a little bit keen to actually now get really involved. So this is people who are they themselves coming to you and saying, listen, I want to do something about my weight. Can you help me? It's starting to cause me knee pain or back pain, or there's a reason why I'm motivated to try and do something about that. In those scenarios, we need to help patients um, understand how they need to feed work for them. So we need to start really becoming individual about understanding um, how people eat. So some people, for example, are grazers. They need to eat all the day. They sort of constantly hungry and eat spits, bits, 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 bits. You get your feasters who don't need to eat very often, but when they eat, they need to eat huge. Um, and you get comfort eaters, for example. These are just some of the examples. And this is the kind of thing we also need to research more. How do we as human beings relate to our, our eating habits? And being able to understand how you feed then gives you a bit more chance of being able to really deal with this little inner chimp of yours and understanding what affects your survival system. So understanding that exhaustion is going to influence the way you shop. Maybe don't do your shopping for food after you come home in the evenings, for example. Um, figure out what you're going to cook in the morning before you come home. Be careful about what you stock in the house. And this is where um, intermittent fasting has become quite fashionable. So there's no metabolic reason why intermittent fasting does anything. And um, people always write these amazing essays. All that happens with intermittent fasting is that you pick certain times in the day or in the week when you're not eating and it reduces the amount of calories you take in overall and if you take in less cal calories um, you, you might lose weight so in terms of actual eating what you are trying to do is you're trying to reduce your need to feed you have to reduce the subconscious um, drive you have to to actually have something and therefore you want to keep yourself stuffed and satisfied after a meal for as long as possible so you want a, your appetite center to think that you've eaten a massive large meal and you can do this by triggering GLP-1 and other hormones. And there's a couple of ways to do this. So option number one and the most important is actually the intake of fibers. So both soluble and insoluble. This is the vegetable bit. Um, but also whole grains works very well here. And they've shown now amazing benefits if you can get your fiber over 35 grams a day. Not so easy. We all eat on average about 16 to 18 grams of fiber a day. Um, and actually figuring out how we build that into our diets is, is a whole nother conversation. Protein also takes longer to digest. Remember, it's harder to digest and much more of it does re le le reach the, the lower part of the gut. Um, and preferably white meat. So red meat has got its own problems and we want to avoid all those processed meat that I've um, mentioned earlier. So some protein is great, um, but on top of that fiber, because the fiber also leads to those short fatty acid chains and various other great things. There's also something called resistant starch, which is interesting. So if you take some of things like maize, rice, pasta, potatoes, um, and you cook it and then you let it cool down, it becomes literally stodgy and is much harder for your body to break down. So much more of it also reaches the lower part of the gut and can also trigger some GLP-1 um, uh, uh, secretion. Um, you don't want to make this the mainstay of your diet because it doesn't have the fiber. So you're not going to get the short chain fatty acids and a lot of the other good stuff. Those are still things that if you are going to include any of those in your diet, you want to, to try and, and use the resistant starch methodology. 
So that this gives us sort of the main diets that's become very popular in the world. And there's three, you can almost divide diets that work um, into three main categories. Um, on the left-hand side here, and they all work in the same way, is our plant-based diets. This is slightly different than what we call vegan because it's actually stricter than vegan. So vegan is basically just don't have any meat or animal products, but plant-based diet is basically don't have ultra processed or anything that is too overly processed. So um, this is very much a whole food, whole food diet, and it works very well because it's high in fiber. One of the big challenges with plant-based diets is you have to have that knowledge in um, both knowledge. You have to understand how to eat healthily because there are things you're not getting in because you're not getting in meat. You might have to take supplements. Uh, you have to be quite good, good in how you cook and prepare the food to make it <clears throat> edible. Um, and it's a much harder diet to sustainable, great for the planet. On the other extreme, we have the low-carb diets, very popular at the moment. They're quite high-protein based or high-fat based, depending on who you're talking to. The principle is still that you're supposed to have lots of vegetables in there. Um, the challenge with this diet is we do not have very good understanding on the long-term effects of this diet. I think if you ate it like the book said, it's probably great because you're supposed to still have vegetables as your core food. But in reality, it's a diet that's too tempting with the amount of protein and fat that's in there. It makes it expensive. It's not very good for the planet. Um, and it's actually not that sustainable for the average human being. One of the biggest problems with this diet is if you cheat on this diet and you put in ultra processed food, this becomes like the worst diet on earth. So this is not a diet. This goes from okay to complete disaster very, very quickly. So the diet that's sort of the moderate one and the one that's got all the evidence, and we know who that which why that one is, is the Mediterranean diet that sits very nicely between the two. Um, and the Mediterranean diet basically works on lots of vegetables, lots of fiber, lots of whole grains, a um, little bit of fish, cut out your red meats, cut out your processed meats, cut out your ultra processed foods, and you can have a little bit of wine. Um, and none of it is uh, working on... Um, massive amounts of weighing or calorie counting or, or anything like that. Now, this is all very posh, and it's for the patient who is now happy to go home with a meal plan. And the biggest question you have to ask yourself when you put a diet together is, can I eat like this for the next 20 years? There's no point in doing a diet that everybody talks about or the alkaline diet or the food group diet, all these weird and wonderful diets out there where you massively commit yourself for three or four months for calorie restriction, you lose a whole lot of weight, you go back to where what you've used to eat, your need to feed kick back in in panic because you've lost the weight. And then a year later, you're back to the weight you were before. And in your lifetime of 30, 40 years, having these massive little, oh my God, I'm going to try and lose weight um, is actually simply a waste of time. Um, and there's also concern that it actually has possible negative effects on your health. So what's made this all interesting, don't worry, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on medication, but of course, once they've discovered GLP-1 after those um, stomach bypasses, they then created a medicine and this has caused a lot of excitement. So you've all probably heard about Ozempic in the newspapers and initially it was all created for type 2 diabetics because they noticed this fact that the, you know, it actually is an incretin and it, it increases insulin release. And that it actually reduces the need to feed, it reduces people's appetites, and it reduces the kind of foods that they crave, which is miraculous. So then there was a study done in 2021 um, on semaglutide, which is one of these, which is a once weekly injection. And this was the first study that was done on non-diabetics um, with people who were at high risk factors. And the, the results are startling. So after 68 weeks, I'm just going to show you this one little number here. The placebo group, these are people who lost more than 10% of their body weight, right? 11.8% in the placebo group. So only 10% of people following the whole diet and whatever advice they were give, given managed to lose 10% of their, of their body weight, which I think is pretty good, actually. Most I don't get 10% of my patients to lose weight. Um, but look in the semaglutide group, 75% of people managed to lose more than 10% of their weight. So... This, of course, hit the newspapers, and then there was various celebrities on the stuff. And the next thing you know, we had a stock out of Ozempic overseas because there was um, the poor diabetics couldn't get their medicines because everybody was getting off-label prescriptions from their GPs. There's, of course, a huge but with this. And the buts are basically, the stuff's very expensive, so it's a few thousand rand a month. It's lifelong. This is not something that you take for a little bit. So you're going to go 
on medicine for the rest of your life when you start with this stuff, if you want to keep that weight off. And they've shown now, as soon as you stop it, again, your body panics, you're going to put all the weight back on again. Um, so there's always this, this rebound effect if you're not on it. And it does have adverse events. So it also got, it's got some gastrointestinal effects. So you're taking somebody to take somebody who's completely healthy, completely beautiful, just to have some subcutaneous fat and put them on this stuff. I personally think is criminal. Where this gets interesting is being able to use that. Say, for example, you've got your um, people in their 50s or 60s with diabetes, CKD, cardiovascular disease, weighing 90, 100 kilograms, struggling with knee pain and back pain. And, and actually for them, this could be an absolute uh, miracle being able to add this into their chronic medicines, like you use statins, we would add in their um, Ozempic if it eventually becomes actually affordable. And there's also a question now, so remember this, we, this is fake, right? This is not actual fiber that we're eating. We're just making the body think we've eaten fiber. And so you're not getting all the benefits from what you would get from eating your fiber and that short chain fatty acids, et cetera. Last two slides, I promise. So in your, so let's go back to where we're at within our rural areas, right? So now you, with a patient, you're sitting like us. We're sitting in a large clinic. We've got lots of patients coming in with diabetes and hypertension handing these people huge massive meal plans and trying to put them on the Mediterranean diet is mad. Um, and what we firstly need to do is actually identify as those most of risk and get away from fat shaming subcutaneous fat. Our target should not be on the scales and get away from BMIs. If you want to watch anything, you can watch the waist circumference, but we actually want to rather look at what can we change in the diet that's actually going to improve the health and not get so obsessed with, with weight loss. Um, and the things we want to aim for, and you're not going to aim for them all at the same time, is we want to aim for diets that has more fiber, fiber in them, quality protein, so getting rid of all those processed meats. We want to get rid of some of those UPFs and we're going to get rid of some of those unhealthy fats. Um, and in family medicine, we, we always look at if you want people to change something, which is now your idea, not their idea, focus on one small thing at a time. So rather than working on massive health plans, can we look at shifting one small thing in the person's diet and slowly creating eating habits over time that makes them more healthy and forget about, about these scales? So tackling the obesogenic environment, I therefore want to ask you, what is in your hospital tuck shop? And to start having a little bit of thought in terms of what are we actually offering our patients? What comes past in the trolley when our patients are waiting? Um, and the, the reality is, is we're never going to shift the ubiquity of UPF. UPFs, and it is amazing to have food that's easily accessible. But it is possible perhaps to make people more aware of what is in food. And even if you have to choose UPFs, there are UPFs that are better and UPFs that, that are worse. Sugar tax, whole nother conversation. We very There's been some great evidence that that can reduce the use of sugar. And um, unfortunately, our minister seems to have lost a bit of uh, traction on that. And then I'm very passionate about, we quite often talk about taxing unhealthy food, but can't we really look at how we can subsidize supporting both our farmers, but really making healthy food much more accessible. So the, the, the problem is not that UP feed, UPF is cheap. The problem is that healthy food can be so, so expensive. In terms of labeling, um, this is from um, Europe. There's actually something called the, the Nutri-Score. Um, very, very evidence-based. It's validated nutrient profiling system. And look, they can actually show you on the left here your risk of cancer, depending on the color of the A, B, C, D, E there. Um, and there's already many countries, this is not enforced, that is putting this score on their packaging. Um, um, and now, interestingly, there's a massive pushback. You can imagine, you remember the anti-vax pushback for COVID? Ooh, now there's a massive pushback ac across to nutrient scores. But in our setting, and we were discussing this at the Bella Bella conference as well, there's a question maybe, can we just become more aware of what a UPF is and perhaps put simple labels on of being able to show people how much sugar, how much fat, and how much fiber is in specific foods. Um, and I mean, for instance, it's interesting to see that a little packet of Smarties has got more calories than 125 grams serving of sweet potato fries, uh, more sugar. Um, 
as well as as well as more fat and then if we're able to identify foods that has upf so if you just got your sticker these are your upf foods then we can start having posters and this is a research question what goes on the poster to say if you have these conditions if you've got young children if you're over a certain age then actually you want to try and limit the amount of UPFs that you actually put in your trolley every month and just start creating awareness both for ourselves as well as our, our patients when you're doing your shopping what is what is it that you are actually um, putting in your trolley so in conclusion we need to be healthy we need to love who we are and we need to enjoy what we eat and to do that we need to basically get a little bit away from the um the obsession with the BMI and start getting into how do we get positive food messaging out there to help us to become healthier and rather than get away from this obsession with the scale. Thank you very much. I do apologize for it being 15 minutes later than I planned. It's the first time I've done this presentation, um, but it will be available to come back to for those that was not able to, to stay for the whole hour and 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like you to put some questions either in the chat or you can raise your hand if you've got any questions or comments. At this point, please remember to put your names and MP numbers in the chat for CPD purposes. I do actually have a poll which I can also launch um, that we can use as well. I'm just checking if there's any questions. Lovely to see people here from all over. Okay, no hands at the moment. It's getting very late. Thank you very much, everybody. Please do feel free to get in touch with me. Um, if you've got any fun or interesting projects you're running in your own area around lifestyle modification, um, as I said, we've been having some challenges with trying to lime, run lifestyle groups and I need to go, I need to go back to the, to the drawing board. Great. And thanks very much for the feedback. That's excellent. Thank you very much, everybody, um, and have a lovely evening. I'm going to end the, the presentation here. Good night.